there, there wasn't a strong path to become from individual computer contributor to engineering manager. So just over time, I've noted, I noticed I'm like, you know, I'm not really coding anymore. I'm still doing something because I'm still, you know, getting, getting raises and saying I'm doing excellent, but I wasn't writing code. And that just felt really uncomfortable because I was like, I, my, my whole persona is built on being a software engineer and being coded and then having those late nights and solving problems. But yet I'm still solving problems. It just looks different. So that made the transition to engineering management a little more, a little easier because I was kind of already there. And it just took some good advice from friends and people are like, Jim, you should try management. You know, you, you enjoy growing people. You enjoy, um, you don't mind getting in front of people and explaining things. And that, those are qualities of perhaps a good leader and you should give it a shot. And that's kind of how it went. Hey, welcome everybody to the Front of Masters podcast. I'm Mark Urbanski, CEO of Front of Masters. And today we have Jem Young. He is a software engineer turned engineering manager at Netflix. We talk about his entire journey, starting from coding on a TI-83, getting into web programming, becoming an engineer at Netflix, and transitioning to management. And all of the things that he likes about being a manager today. So it's a really fun conversation and I hope you enjoy it. So tell me, what do you like about Fast and Furious? You mean the greatest franchise of all time? Yeah. What hey, do I like about let's, it? Yeah, let's dig into I it. I thought this was a serious podcast. This is. You, this is very serious. serious yeah, yeah. Um, I like the ridiculousness of it. I see. It just keeps going. If you look back in, when it came out, 2001, you would never think this movie about cars and people stealing cars and, you know, gangsters of, of sort would turn into a $10 billion uh, franchise which only gets more and more ridiculous over time, but it does. Uh, well, I saw the first one, so can you tell me how ridiculous it gets, or I just I have to watch it? it let's I, say I need, it, uh, I need like one spoiler here. The laws of physics are broken um, pretty much regularly. It doesn't apply uh, laws of uh, uh, friction and cohesion of what tires can actually do, like hold to the pavement. Don't matter. Um, yeah, cars turn into planes. Cars turn into boats, um, cars self-drive. It, it just, it breaks uh, the laws of reality. And it's great. All right. And even, yeah. And so as someone that loves like ridiculous stuff, I, I think I'll, I should really dig into future series. So thanks for that. I definitely will watch them. I, I'm embarrassed that you haven't. I yeah, are we even uh, talking right now? We should go do that after this. Uh, all right, let's do it. Fast and Furious watch series. Marathon. It, Marathon, it, just, yeah. it just goes downhill. Cool. Um, so yeah, you're you're into cars then. Yeah. You like cars. What do you like about cars? <laughs> 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 they tell me like like F one cars and cars that go fast. Is uh, this true? Yeah, car F one cars go pretty fast. All right. So they so, say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I know nothing about cars, so at all. <laughs> nothing. What do you What do you drive, Mark? Uh, I, I current currently we have a a van. We have four kids and we have the Tesla X. So it's like the only electric vehicle really that could fit my entire family. I bought that a couple of years ago. So if there was like a more reasonable, you know, electric car that could mm. fit my entire family, I would put them in it. But in this case, it's just a van and an X. I like the X. It's a, it's a hundred thousand dollar minivan. And it's when true. I tell people that they're like, Oh, it's not a minivan. I'm like, it's a minivan. It um, absolutely is. Yeah. And that's cool. So it's we basically cool. have two minivans. Just one is electric and yeah. it has doors that go like this. Those are cool doors. So, yeah. yeah. That's not too bad. Um, yeah, I do like cars. I, I have two only cause my driveway can't fit more than that. But yeah, I've always liked cars. I, I'd say fast and furious got me into cars because really, so that's your origin story for your love for cars. Was fast yeah, and furious. It, it really, really, really was. Wow. You know, when you're 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 a young man in your twenties, you don't really have an identity to cling on to. I was like, oh, cars, that's a thing. And people tune them; it's a hobby you can pick up, and that's how I got in the cars ever since. So it was, was Fast and Furious. So I joke about it, and the series has gotten way out of hand. But yeah, uh, I'll always have that with Fast and Furious. Yeah, I do have a friend that has like a rally racing hobby, and he would actually like use the computer to fine tune how much gas goes into the whatever thing and the stuff it was pretty cool but yeah i never got into it myself so all right so are there any special skills that you have that people might not know about um i could give a talk on anything at any given time 
I don't know if that's a skill. It, you're like, Jem, we need you to do a workshop real quick on pick any subject. And I could Siamese talk about Siamese cats. You want to talk about Siamese cats? I mean, I, I could. I can make stuff up. It's a, I don't know if it's a skill, but yeah, I, I can do that. I'm also really tall. These chairs are not really given an uh, impression, but yeah. So they had to boost me up a lot to get to you. <laughs> <laughs> eye to eye with you. I feel like I'm slightly lower for some reason. That's that's weird. Yeah. Uh, no, we're definitely eye to eye, but <laughs> but you're just used to towering over everyone else. I think that's what it is. I don't think about it, yeah. but sometimes I get like way down, and I'm like, oh, this is how other people see the world. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, as a exactly average male, I'm five foot nine. Um, that's how I see the world. Mark, yeah. you're a beautiful. Eye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's talk about uh, when did you first uh, get like experience with code or get in, interested in computers and code in the first place? Way back, way early back, uh, maybe 11, 12. My, my dad had an Apple, I forget which one exactly, but just play around with it. Um, and they had a weird fe feature in Apple where if you hold down the shift key, it would like double your RAM somehow. Hmm. Now I understand how that worked. It was just writing to the hard drive, and it wasn't really doubling your RAM. But I was like, oh, fascinating. And ever since then, I, I've been into computers. I think the first thing I ever coded was on a calculator because I was bored in math. And those old TI-83s had their way of coding. And you're just like, I'm so bored. And really basic, like, if-else and Yeah, that's exactly how I got into programming. Yeah. And also, we just had Mike North on the podcast. That's how he got into programming as well. <laughs> so, yeah, it's... That TI-83 programming language did a lot for us. Sponsored by Texas Instruments. Yeah, exactly. Like, I found out that you could download games onto it, and then you could actually open up the source code, and that's how I learned, because I would modify the games and be able to uh, make my own games. Fancy. Yeah, I've heard modern calculators have Wi-Fi. They can connect to the internet, which kind of is not as fun, because then it's just a computer. It's not... The challenges in there but yeah i remember it was like a usb cable and you had to go some weird website and <laughs> download some stuff i don't know it was it's pretty sketchy back then but that's really cool that you got got going on the ti-83 and then how about like school or your your background for there? computers yeah 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 um or school? did yeah did yeah. you actually go to school for computers i guess i didn't Drop okay. down in elementary. Okay. This is all natural. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, and school computers were still sort of a thing. The internet wasn't really as big of a thing. It was more um, coming up. I think the biggest search engine back then was uh, Dogpile. Remember that? And Lycos. Uh, Ask Jeeves was a, was a thing back then. I Yeah, I actually didn't even... The first experience I had on a real computer was... Um, yahoo so i was like pretty late to the game i missed all of those other search engines i think i remember when google first came out and i think it was a library and it's only it's like oh have you tried this this small company called google and i was like yeah let me try the search and i was like oh this is pretty good and i didn't use other since uh, but yeah com school was a big big deal for me when i uh i you know i was a bit of a miscreant when on the computer network i definitely Shut some of them down in my high school, and so you're a hacker. Hacking such a dirty word. Um, <laughs> I was a, a explorer of the network, and I wasn't going to let a password or anything like that get in my way. And eventually, I, I had good teachers who were like, "Just let Jem do what he's going to do. He's not going to cause any trouble," which was really helpful. So I I led the computer science club in high school, um, did LAN parties, played on the network, and all that sort of things that you couldn't do today in, in school networks, but they're just like, it's fine, which was really helpful. So in like high school, did you do that whole uh, command to the network where it'd pop up and a message to everyone, oh, that yeah. kind of stuff? Yeah. yeah. I, I even, um, I think we were, I forget what spreadsheet software we were, we were using at the time, but I managed to guess the password. It was admin. Um, <laughs> Who would have thought? And I, I made a recurring message to say this class is boring to pop up every minute. Now I regret that. That's such an immature, mean thing to do. But at the time, I thought it was hilarious. And the teacher didn't know how to fix it because, you know, I was better at computers than most people. Um, and then in college, I got my computer science degree. One of those, like, I never had any doubt in my mind when I started college of what I was going to do. It was always computer science. So I did that. That was a very difficult degree. But, yeah, so you can say I've always been into computers in some fashion. So you were the president of the computer science club? In high school, yeah. In high school, got it. 
Yeah. I was the president in college. So, oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Is it one ups and shit? It was literally like there I'm was. I'm going to adjust my chair up now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one up. I think there was like 10 people in the entire program. So competition wasn't too high in my case. But I, I graduated with two people in my class. We started with like 100 and it just whittled down to two. Hmm. So, yeah. It's yeah, so similar guys. story. Yeah, there was actually one other person that graduated with me with computer science. So yeah, but in the entire the program, yeah. well, it's it's like it was a small uh, school up in northern Minnesota. So okay, yeah, mine was, was a small school in Georgia. Yeah, so yeah. similar, similar story there. Um, yeah, and then how did you kind of transition into you know going out of college? Like, what kind of programming things did you do, or like how did you get your first gig? Um, Networking is always super important. My mm -hmm. roommate had a job at a small healthcare company in town. And the year before I graduated, I started working there. Uh, he got me a job there. And from there, um, you know, I turned out, I learned I didn't know anything about programming. I was like, I have this degree. I, obviously, I'm ready for the real world and make an impact. And then you get to the real world and it's like, no one's telling you what to do anymore. And definitely, I had a lot of good mentors who took the time to educate me. That's where I picked up JavaScript from moving from Java to JavaScript, where I love to build UIs and found like, this is way more satisfying than working on the back end. That's cool. So yeah, what, uh, yeah, so did you do the whole um, table layouts and that kind of thing? Oh yeah. So yeah, yeah you started in that era? Um, I think Ajax was just becoming a thing, okay. like revolutionary. Um, Backbone was becoming a thing. So really early days for JavaScript, and I'm surprised we even made it out of like, I won't say the dark ages, but um, like, things were pretty challenging. Like you couldn't debug. There's no debugger. There was all console, and console log wasn't even supported all the way. So you had to do alerts, uh, especially in IE, which was the dominant browser back then. Just debug alert. What does that say? I don't know. Uh, yeah, kids these days they have it so much easier. Like their their tooling is like forward and backward in history and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm thinking about those days where we went from alerts to Firebug. Mm. And uh, Firebug, Firebug was amazing. I couldn't believe you could like inspect the DOM and like, yeah, that was, that was amazing. I think Chrome Inspector like got a lot of their inspiration from Firebug. Oh yeah, it's yeah. like, oh wow, this is how a things direct be. copy for sure. Oh yeah, I mean. Yeah, because Firefox it. had, uh, well Firebug, got built into Firefox and then Firefox actually had, I think, market dominance at the time. Yeah. And then when Chrome came out, they just were like, hey, we yeah, made this so much faster and just a bunch of dev tools um, out of the box that were, yeah, direct clone, but um, they added more features like networking and performance and et cetera. And now Chrome is the dominant browser. Fun, fun uh, fact of history, yep. um, the PM of Chrome, the product manager of Chrome, uh, Sundar Pichai is now uh, the CEO of Google. So you can see the impact of that, how that browser has played on the like the performance of the company over time. And you're like, it's just a browser, but it really makes you think of like how the internet works and what's important. Absolutely. Yeah. They, and in a lot of ways, um, you know, native mobile was just dominating for a while there and the fact that like browsers all of a sudden decided to start innovating and really led by chrome like kind of brought the web back in a way yeah um, now we're in a, a weird spot with chrome where they're yeah maybe pushing some things that are definitely in favor of them and selling more ads and maybe not for the benefit of the internet anymore so yeah uh, well we all kind of saw that coming but <laughs> microsoft did it with internet explorer yeah. uh, we've kind of just come full circle all these years later for sure. And uh, like throughout your career, I know you've you've spent a, a fair amount of time mentoring, right? Yeah. Um, so do you have any uh, advice for like new people coming into the field, you know, um, making that transition from college to early career? I hate to say networking, but tech is so small. Um, you and I have known each other for years now through a mm -hmm. mutual friend who knows another mutual friend. And you just find that. I, I think quality people always surface up. So it's good to network and be friends uh, with other people. And not in a um, what's in it for me type way, just in a there's a lot of interesting people. And as you grow in your career with other people, you'll find out you have different interests. Some people move to be excellent designers. Some are like, I'm really passionate about this low level like WebAssembly stuff. 
some people are experts at UX and you're, you're going to kind of branch out. It's good having friends who know lots of different types of technology. Uh, it, it, it's really satisfying to see how we've all grown in different ways. Yeah, absolutely. The more relationships you can make and yeah, like you said, not doing it from a selfish perspective, but like, how can I help? You know, yeah. um, it's going to pay off in dividends for sure. But I, I'd say early career, focus on code. There's, there's so many things you can be doing and get into, you know, browser wars or, you know, language wars and things like that. There's a point in your career where you'll realize software engineering is a lot more than code. And you start thinking that seeing the bigger picture and how systems interact and all that sort of thing. But you can't ever recapture that, that feeling of just late nights, drinking a, a Red Bull, eating bacon, stacking that bacon. <laughs> <laughs> stacking bacon. Yeah, bef- yeah, the stacking bacon references before the podcast, we were telling a story about land parties and how, uh, yeah, in college, I ran a land party where we all showed up with a 12 pack of Mountain Dew. And then I went to the store and just bought tons of packages of bacon. And we just, I pulled out all the skillets and we just all made bacon and like passed out plates of bacon. It was a bacon and Mountain Dew. <laughs> Uh, but you know, we were like 20, so I, I think we should, uh, make that the theme of this podcast is making bacon, stacking bacon. Uh, but, but in all seriousness, the, um, that passion and finding kind of, uh, other people have that passion and staying up late and solving problems and saying like, Hey, look at this PR. I, I figured out this bug. And you know, that, that early exuberance you have for, for coding, it does go away. It, it just changed into something different as you mature and realize, you know, there's a lot more to software engineering than code. So early career, focus on doing that. Stay up late, solve those problems. That's how you and I became good at code, was just making a lot of mistakes, seeing if we can build something, challenging ourselves. And I, I really emphasize people doing that rather than focus on like, how can I grow my career? Or how can I move the management? Or how can I become a, a principal engineer someday? Focus on, on coding in the early days. Yeah, rather than focusing on outcomes, like focus on the skill in the early days because the skill will carry you through the rest of your career for sure. Yeah, make mistakes. Don't don't just follow a demo. You won't learn anything from t- someone telling you step by step. So start with something, have an outcome. If you get stuck, get some hints. But build stuff on your own. Like You will learn a lot more from failure than you do from completing that to-do list app or whatever it is you're trying to build. Yeah, and I mean people... Uh, that circles back to the whole like work life balance thing, right? And I, yeah, I, it's hard pressed to find people who are really, really successful in their career that didn't have those early days where they were really like, you know, um, kind of throwing themselves into gathering as many skills as possible. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, I like the way you, yeah, you have to throw yourself into it. And when you're young and don't have responsibilities or kids or a mortgage or things like that. You can and like absolutely do that. And those people tend to be better software engineers later down the road. Yeah, absolutely. You get to carry those skills with you for yeah. years and years and years. Yeah. So yeah, now that we have kids, like, you know, we can have a you know, maybe a little bit different relationship with their career. But um yeah, in the early days it's yeah, it's critical. So how did you get into uh speaking and teaching? So you, you said you can give a talk about anything, <laughs> right? Yeah. How like when did that start? Um, oh, good question. Maybe way back in high school, uh, I joined, I was in musical theater, funny enough. I'm not hmm. really a theater, theater kid, but they're like, we need more men. There's like five guys and, and 20 women, uh, in my junior high school class. And they're like, we need, we need men to participate in this. And I was like, okay, you say 30 women. I right, just, just being real about my younger self. Yeah. Uh, so I did musical theater. So it kind of made me, I can't sing, I can't dance, but um, I was a good background person, but it made me more comfortable being on stage in front of people. It, I was like, you know, it's really not as hard as you think. Um, I did chorus too. Same reason. They're like, we need more men in chorus. So we have nothing but women. I'm like, okay, uh, I'll join chorus. I can't sing. Again, uh, weird fact, I sang in my high school graduation and I can't sing. So I started off really strong. I was like, oh, and people are like, woo, go jam. And then I like went to my next note and like missed it completely. And everybody's like, go job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I asked my parents, like, how'd I do, mom and dad? They're like, yeah, that was that was something. Um, so I can't sing. I, I'm fine with that. Uh, you but started out strong. but Started off yeah, strong. Yeah. But that made me comfortable with getting in front of people. And then 
that transitioned into tech in my first job or early job uh, speaking at a meetup. I was like, this isn't that hard. Like speaking off the cuff is not that hard. Uh, and I like doing it. Yeah. I mean, it is a skill to think on your feet a little bit, but uh, I, yeah, sometimes I get a little bit nervous. I'm like getting my own head, but like, yeah, I think if you're just like, yeah, no, it'll, it'll work out. And you have that confidence coming into it. Um, it usually does. Mark, you're doing great. You don't uh, be nervous. Don't be nervous you. about me. This thank is you. natural. <laughs> uh, yeah. So how did you start teaching at front of masters? Uh, mutual friend, Brian Holt. Um, okay. I, I'd given a workshop for which conference? I forget some conference way back in San Francisco. And he was like, Hey, I know Mark Grabinski. He, he does this thing. Do you want to give a workshop there? And I think you and I talked and I was like, yeah, I'll give it a, give it a shot. It was full stack for front end version yeah. one way back in the, before front end masters was like the, the major, major thing that it is today. Uh, so a long time ago. So again, networking, just knowing people who know people and kind of all works out. Yeah. And that's still to this day, you're like epic series. You got front end for full stack engineers uh, or full stack for front end engineers version three now. So uh, yeah, what what uh, keeps you teaching? I mean, you, you've taught uh, interviewing for software engineers and the full stack for front end course, and then now came back and teaching technical management. So what keeps you teaching? And I have one on WebAssembly too. And WebAssembly, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Don't want to forget WebAssembly. I, I like the the I like seeing people learn, I, but mainly it's a lot for me. It, it by having to teach something, it forces me to think critically about what I'm saying and kind of what I believe in. What are the skills that are necessary that I need to polish up? Versus before, you know, with kids and being an engineering manager, I don't have time to do that. So it's really a forcing function for me to be more serious and, and think uh, and set aside time to become better at some skill. I really like full stack because it's one of those, like it's a gap for a lot of front end engineers that they don't understand how the servers work, how the internet works, how the back end, how all these systems come together so that you can show some JavaScript in a browser. So I really like teaching people that. And then getting comments years later is like, Jim, you know, you actually, I switched from, from front end to being a back end because it actually turns out I was really passionate about this area or, you know, I'm a better engineer now because I understand how to talk to people and other teams and their priorities and the technologies they use. And that's so satisfying. Um, it takes a long time and I don't do it for, for that, but having an impact on people's lives and their careers is totally worthwhile. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's awesome. I mean, we get comments all the time, which we should share more of them with you, but, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, they, they come in all the time about, yeah, people love that course. Absolutely love it. And, uh, yeah, so from there, like any advice you would give to people who are thinking about teaching or want to teach? I, I advise everybody teaching something, whether it's for, uh, you know, something prestigious like front end masters or just in front of your, your immediate team on like, hey, here's something I learned. Public speaking uh, is a skill that you can only do by public speaking. You can't, you won't really be, get good at it just practicing or reading about it. You have to do it. But it's one of those so obvious skills that a lot of people don't invest any time in it, but you have to. At the end of the day, you can't make anybody do anything. You have to convince them. And the way to do that is through communication. And all that communication is public speaking. And I'm, I'm always surprised at the number of people that maybe are high ranking in a company that aren't good at public speaking. They're not good at convincing people or explaining things simply. So invest today, make it small, give a, you know, a five minute presentation in front of your team on here's a demo, here's something I learned. And you don't have to go big, but you'll get better over time or you won't. Um, I mean, yeah, you don't have to get bigger and bigger and bigger, but at least it's something you have in your back pocket that you're like, okay, it's not so scary. I don't like doing it, but I can if I need to. Yeah, I like that uh, advice of uh, doing a brown bag lunch session, like minimally or you know, th there's always opportunities out there to teach local meetups, conferences, et cetera. There's lots of places to like try it out and see if it's right for you or just, yeah, flexing that muscle and trying to learn a new skill because, yeah, teaching definitely pays off. And you don't have to teach like live and in person. Sometimes you can teach with a blog if That's you're true, a really yeah. good writer. I'm not a good writer. It takes me so long to, to write a paragraph or something because I overthink it. Mm. Um, but I'm much better off the cuff on my feet. 
like kind of like doing this. Yeah. Uh, but some people are really good writers and really strong writers. And if that's the way you want to do it, you should absolutely do it. And mm-hmm. I, I, I do believe it's the, it's a responsibility of people who've been successful like you and I, um, and who have experience to help others and put our hands out and pull them up and whatever way you can do that, whether it's mentoring or teaching, um, you absolutely should. I, I think that's like the responsibility we have. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Um, so yeah, I mean, you've spent most of your career at Netflix. So how did you get there in the, in the first place? Like your first, you know, entry in, uh, funny, fun story. It involved public speaking. Okay. I, there's a conference called react rally way back in the day when react mm. was a little bit newer. Um, JavaScript had just released its newest version or its latest version and something that hadn't happened in years and years and years. Mm. And so I gave a talk on. React with, uh, I think it's like ES 2015 or something like that, way back in the day. And I was speaking at this conference, and my first ever conference talk, and there was someone in the, in the audience, Ryan Burgess, who's also an instructor on Front End Masters, who was there and is like, Jem seems like a pretty cool dude, and maybe I want to work with him. And uh, it took him a while to convince me to even come interview. I was like, no, nah, maybe someday I'll end up at Netflix, like, but I don't have the skill set yet. And he's like, come on, what's the worst that can happen? Um, so I interviewed him. You know, I guess the worst happened. I got the role, and that's how I ended up in Netflix for probably almost eight years now. Wow, that's awesome! I, not a lot of people have like that longevity of a, a place and still being excited about the place you work and all that kind of stuff. So, um, what kinds of things were you doing when you started? Um, mostly, I was working on as a UI engineer on the Netflix.com homepage. So, a lot of Netflix is really famous for experimentation, running a lot of A/B tests, and that's what I built. A-B tests uh, and different variants of whatever we're trying to find out more about. Um, did a lot of that, but over time, uh, platform is always called to me, like the back end or even the the middle tier of things of between UI and the servers. I just always loved and making tooling and making other people more productive. And that's, I always ended up doing that. Like I'd create, find reasons to create my own services or things like that, uh, that other en- front engineers weren't necessarily interested in. And Eventually, the opportunity came around to become a manager of um, kind of the platform team for Netflix.com. And that's what I do today is I, I manage that team. So, yeah, I kind of went with my heart, but it works out well because I find a lot of satisfaction in, in doing it. So do you have any stories from, like, you know, any lore, any Netflix lore or stories from, like, you know, maybe the early days of working there? Um when I started, there's maybe a couple hundred engineers. Even today, it, Netflix engineering is not as big as people think it is. We're probably 2,500 or so engineers, which sounds like a lot to, you know, if you're coming from a small company. But compared to the companies we're compared against, you know, your Microsofts, your, your Apples, your Googles, um, we're like a fraction of their engineering size. So the fact that we get as much done we do with, with as few engineers as we do, it's something I've always appreciated. And I saw that in the early days where just people knew a lot of stuff, but they were still really approachable. And seeing us grow from the number of engineers we have today and the company size is maybe a couple thousand. And now Netflix as a company is at 13,000 or so, which is just mind boggling. Um, the early days, we didn't have studio. We didn't produce our own content. I think when I joined, we had just made House of Cards was a thing. Orange is the New Black was a thing. Um, there was like, oh, that, that's that's nice. You're making your own content, and watching that expand into its entire business, where Netflix is now, you know, compared to Disney and, and Fox and the other like big media producers, has been pretty interesting. But the more interesting side is like the engineering hasn't changed. Like we still have the same culture as when we started, and that preserving that after all the changes and and um, uh, leadership changes and, and just uh, the market changes and business changes, we're still the same. Like that. Le- we make leaders of people and we still execute well and we still talk to each other and give each other feedback that hasn't changed. And that's just incredible after all these years. And you talked about, um, that transition from going from, uh, the UI side to like, uh, getting some type of, I think you got promoted and to like infrastructure side. Like, do you have any advice for maybe that, that stage? Cause I think there's quite a few people like, you know, in the front of master's community that's in that mid-level wanting to go to senior and beyond. It's, 
I think moving from, say, UI to more of the backend side of things or even full stack, it calls the people. And when, I, when I'm when i hiring and I interview people, I ask them, I'm like, why did you get into software engineering? Um, what do you know about platform engineering? And the people that are like passionate about making other people more productive, unblocking them, supporting them, helping ship these big goals, it just comes out. And some people are, are passionate about it. They're built for it. Some people aren't. And I'd say if you are passionate, lean into that. You don't have to do... You don't have to fit into a box of software engineering. You don't have to be a UI engineer or say, I'm a UX engineer. You don't have to fit into any sort of box. Go with what your passion area is. And some people, they actually move out of, it, out of engineering. It turns out product management is way more interesting to them, different challenges, or design is actually more interesting to them. So in general, if you're thinking about that transition of how do I go from mid-level or junior to more senior, start thinking about what you want to specialize in. And it's okay if that changes over time, but it's a lot easier to make that transition if you can focus on a few areas rather than trying to be, I'm a good jack of all trades. Cool. And then you like, uh, well, you said you transitioned into engineering manager. Like, what was that like? Or did you get uh, tapped on the shoulder and, hey, Jim, you should manage? Or, you know, how did that transition go? Uh, it was deliberate. Um, okay. The Netflix way has long been, if you want it, you go get it. There, there wasn't a strong path to become from individual computer contributor to engineering manager. So just over time, I've noted, I noticed I'm like, you know, I'm not really coding anymore. I'm still doing something because I'm still, you know, getting, getting raises and saying I'm doing excellent, but I wasn't writing code. And that just felt really uncomfortable because I was like, I, my, my whole persona is built on being a software engineer and being coded and then having those late nights and solving problems. But yet I'm still solving problems. It just looks different. So that made the transition to engineering management a little more, a little easier because I was kind of already there. And it just took some good advice from friends and people are like, Jim, you should try management. You know, you, you enjoy growing people. You enjoy, um, you don't mind getting in front of people and explaining things. And that, those are qualities of perhaps a good leader and you should give it a shot. And that's kind of how it went. So you found yourself kind of taking on some of those more leadership things, even though um, you didn't have it in title. You just st stopped writing as much code and started communicating a lot more, and it just seemed like the natural next step. Yeah, yeah. I, I, like a good leader plays a lot of roles, but mainly they they fill gaps. And there was gaps that I saw that someone had to do it. Um, and most most software engineers probably don't want to write project memos and lead projects and set set deadlines. I didn't really like that either, but I'm like it needs to be done. And what it turns out, looking back, people were really grateful for me taking on that role so they can get back to coding. And that is kind of what an engineering manager does, is like take on all that other work that's not directly coding. So I made the transition a little bit easier. So what advice would you give to somebody who's like considering that path? Uh, think critically about if you really want to be a people leader, the satisfaction you get in your day-to-day -day from writing code and shipping code and closing tickets and shipping bugs and being able to like ignore the world and go heads down to solve a really gnarly problem. <clears throat> you don't have that anymore. The satisfaction you find is very different and you have to look a lot harder for it and it takes a long time to play out. So it's very worthwhile. It's a very, um, I think you said it earlier um, in the day when we were having a conversation where you said management isn't fun, but it's, it's, it's fulfilling. And that's the right attitude you have to take. So if you're looking to make that transition, recognize that. That that fulfillment is just going to take longer to see. And you're going from zero. You're starting at zero again. You may be a super seasoned uh, software engineer who knows a lot. A lot of those skills don't, don't matter anymore. So it's something you have to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Going from coder to like leading a company is... is uh been an interesting transition. I mean, I absolutely love JavaScript and <laughs> UI development, well, all types of languages and programming. And um, yeah, I, I found that to be the most fun thing to do professionally. Um, but then when it came to seeing a problem in the market that I, I feel like needs to exist, but like at the end of the day, I can't code my way to customers. <laughs> You know, some people can, they seem to have like all of the skills, whatever, but it was like, I, I had enough business and marketing skills to, 
you know, and enough leadership skills to like, hey, try this with me and, and get more people uh, to work on something together. But uh, yeah, it was a completely new set of, or, you know, completely different set of skills. And yeah, super not rewarding <laughs> in the short term. Uh, but yeah, long term, obviously, you know, front of masters exists and, um, you know, there's you know, 50 plus teachers and 20 people working in various parts of the company and it's it's rewarding to see everybody working together on the same thing and and uh seeing what people are able to you know do together like the sum of the parts is greater than the, the individual or whatever um and so that's yeah it's you're kind of elevating your thinking towards you know it, taking a coder's perspective towards it it's like everything is a systems design challenge, whether there are components working together or in this case, it's people working together and people are infinitely more complex than code components. You know, they have to, you know, but if you set out like goals, people are very good at, you know, self-organizing or like working together towards um, something bigger. And that, you know, that's something that, you know, code can't do or well, <laughs> Maybe it will someday with <laughs> AI or whatever, but um, yeah, it's just amazing to see like how you set something out there and like everybody can kind of like problem solve together in ways that uh, is really satisfying to watch. Yeah, and 100% agree with everything you said, but you can talk about it, but actually you, it's hard to appreciate it until you actually do it. And that's, that's always a challenge of engineering that's true. leadership is you don't know, you, you can't experience it. Like, and the challenges even you, you go through in your day to day as, as CEO of the company are probably like things that you can't explain well to other people because it just doesn't translate into their perspective of software engineering. But it, there are, a lot of them are software engineering problems just in a different lens. Yeah, it's much easier to talk about uh, a framework or a API or something like that uh, to somebody else and debate about it. Like, cause it's not a person, right? Yeah. <laughs> or it's not a process or it's not whatever. It's, it's a, much easier to talk about code for sure. Um, but you did it. You you taught uh, today on technical management. So uh, yeah, I think people will get a lot of value out of it. I guess I could have plugged my own course through you asked, <laughs> like, how do you become an engineering manager? Like, well, I'm glad you asked. But, <laughs> yeah. Technical yeah. Management 101 with Jem Young. <laughs> it will be on frontofmasters.com soon, coming to a website near you. Um, so how about uh, you've recently become a father in the last like three years you have you have two kids right yeah one and three and um how how do you feel like that's changed your perspective towards your career and your goals or has it um it, it has i think one is prioritizing my time i don't have infinite time to to go code or do other things um things that i used to think were important like catching up on the latest netflix show or knowing what the, the latest twitter drama just becomes background noise. Um, that's a, like a really big change in my personal priorities. Career-wise, I, I do think about, you know, where do I want to, how do I want my, my life to, to turn out? Do I want to go back to a startup where like it, it's much more demanding, but the, the rewards are there? Or do I want to like say the enterprise route where things are a little more stable, a little more steady for the kids? Um, overall though, I, I'd say there's a lot of overlap between engineering management and being a parent in that a lot of it is, it comes down to you and you being a, com, becoming a better person and being more self-aware and your, your instincts of sometimes the kids are making a mess or they, they found a bag of flour and they're chasing each other around the house. And you're just like, ah, you want to flip out, but you have to have a lot of personal restraint. And that, that shows up well in terms of people leadership too, because they're both people leadership when you think about it. Um, not that engineers are, are children, but all of it comes back to like myself and I can't change what people are doing, but I can change how I respond to that. And it's a hard lesson to learn. I'm not good at it. I'll be, be honest, but I find it helpful that the lessons in, in parenting and leadership are very similar because humans are humans. Yeah. And you kind of talked about a little bit of self doubt there. I think in your course, you talked about imposter syndrome. Could you talk about, or could you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, you, you, you always have that. I, I always have that. And now I've been a manager for relatively early in my career for, for management. Um, it'll be three years next year. Um, and I'm still like, am I doing the right thing? 
I don't know. Am I representing the team well? Am I focusing my time? Am I, am I, is the team functioning well? Do they respect each other? Are they healthy? There's always things I could be doing and I, I doubt and I second guess myself sometimes. But over time, I'm, I'm building up more confidence to say like, you know what? No one knows what they're doing. Mm. And we're all doing the best we can with the information that we have. And as long as your intent is good, even if you're wrong, that's fine. It's okay to make mistakes. And that's a lot of what I teach in, my, in the course too on the Engineering Management 101 is you kind of make mistakes and you, you can't beat yourself up over it. But it, does imposter syndrome go away? No. It, it never does. You just kind of learn to quiet that voice a little bit. And honestly, I think if it completely goes away, <laughs> that's probably not a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, you should always be in a situation where you're learning, you're a little bit outside of your comfort zone and you're, you know, yeah, you're, you're pushing yourself and, and, uh, you know, nobody's an all powerful being that knows every single thing at every single t point in time. So yeah, we're always going to be learning. And like you, you talked about in your course too, like people change. Mm -hmm. So even if you're working with the same people, like you have to continue to evolve. The business evolves, the people evolve, like, and you yourself have to evolve if you want to continue to add value. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I'd say probably shouldn't ever go away and, and to like, an, a certain extent. And your point on like being this all powerful, all knowing, never makes mistakes, you're setting yourself up for failure and stress if you try to pretend like you know what people are like, oh, that technology, yeah, yeah, I know about that. And you interject yourself and mm. you're just stressing yourself in a way that is unproductive and it's just going to lead to failure. So it's better to, to be candid and be like, you know what? I'm not good at these things. I would like to get better. Maybe I never will, but I can at least become okay at, at some of the gaps. But trying to be the, the super person and be everything to everyone, you just it's just not possible. No one, no one is that good. It doesn't matter what image they project. No one has that. Everybody has things they need to fill. Um, but I think a lot of that's lost in maybe modern society where it's all like your image is very curated and you know, look at the look at look at Mark, happy man, successful CEO of company, works out all the time, great shape, has great friends. Um, he has no problems now in life you're whatsoever. Me blush. <laughs> but <laughs> right. you know, that's you'd be like, oh, Mark has the perfect life. Look at him. Um, but you have problems too, and you you have challenges you have to overcome, and things you want to get better at. And I think that's important to share and realize. You know, life is hard, and we're all trying to do the best we can, but no one has it down. Yeah, I think uh, my advice is always uh, people, if, if you're leading people or in the case of being a father or whatever, whatever your role is, people can tell if you're trying. Whether it's just being a good friend to somebody else, like at the end of the day, when everything fades away or whatever and people think about, you know, the relationship that you have with you or, or the, you know, work relationship or whatever, it's like, I, I think people can tell if you're trying. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's, I love that. yeah. that's like, I don't know. That's always my advice. It's like when people ask me about, you know, being a father advice for being a father, but I'm like, at the end of the day, your kids can tell if you're trying, <laughs> like they, they won't be able to articulate it, but they'll feel it. And especially when they're an adult, like, I think that's, you know, they're obvious. My kids are, my oldest is only 10. So <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah are you trying or not i think that's that's the best question to ask for yeah. yourself um we we overweight success um because we only show that we only show people yeah. successful and the stories we listen to and the lessons we learn are only from successful people and that leaves out luck luck is a huge factor in in life yeah people a lot of people that are successful have been lucky I'm not saying that i'm smarter i haven't earned it but there's luck in there too but really, you know, it, something about being a father, and I know you can speak to this too, is you have to be comfortable with failure. You're going to fail most of the things you try in life. And what's, what's important is like what you take away from that failure. If you're only focused on success and be, becoming successful, you're, you're just not going to be a happy human being. Yeah, the process of learning any new thing is wrought with <laughs> failure and failed attempts. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm learning a lot of things in the gym with gymnastics right now. And so it's like, yeah, pat, padding is important. Pat, <laughs> pads are important when you're learning a new skill. So that's, uh, but so uh, what are you excited about these days? Hmm. What I'm excited about? Uh, 
my my youngest son is, is walking and he's he's a bundle of energy he's totally different from my oldest and it's it's just fascinating to see how they diverge but they're also similar in some ways too which mm -hmm. either a reflection of parenting or genetics or something but i don't know it, that's really exciting for me just seeing that growth on the um, i think the career side of things i don't know if exciting is the right word but it's interesting to see our kind of renewed focus in in tech where we had it good for 12 years the market kept going up it didn't matter what your company did you were going to get funded everybody's getting raises and promotions and all these things and now that's that's gone the the market has shifted it's a lot harder to get a, a job and it makes us focus more on what's important mm -hmm. and it forces me to to become like more efficient in the way i operate versus before i probably could have gotten away with more bad habits and things like that but now i have to become better so Maybe not exciting as much, but it's an interesting time to to learn and grow, and hopefully we get back to those those golden golden age and good times. Maybe we won't ever. I don't know, but the best I can do is is respond positively and take it all in, in stride. Yeah, even with front of the masters, uh, the the types of proposals we used to get in those like frothy periods is like here's this crypto course or NFT course or whatever. It's just like. Uh, you know, we dodged most of that. <laughs> I think we only did one course, um, and it was more on the technology side rather than, um, but yeah, it's, it's, a uh, it was a wild period where VC was, money was funding like everything. So now we're kind of yeah back to reality and people's proposals are really, really excellent right now. Uh, <laughs> people are really pushing the boundaries of, of what they're capable of teaching and, um, and making it really practical. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a sobering period, but in this period, I think a lot of, you know, course correcting happens. Yeah. And I think um, looking forward to technology, AI is, you know, I, I'm probably not going to be the first person on the podcast to talk about the impact it's going to have. You know, I use it in communication. It's like, I have this idea, let me get it in raw form, which has been super helpful as me as a perfectionist and like what I say and just like not overthinking. I was like, oh, yeah, that's that's good. But let me put it through here. And then we talk about, um, we haven't really talked about it too heavily, but like quantum computing is coming up. Something mm -hmm. in the next, like our children's lives will definitely be a thing. Mm -hmm. It rethinks how we do security, how we think about even how computers work, how software works in, in a quantum world. And you combine these two things together. It's kind of scary what technology can do. And I think what we can do now is, as people in tech is try to shape that positively so it doesn't kill all of humanity or something like that um we we joke but like i think people who understand yeah. technology understands like how scary some of this stuff is and we do need to keep a rein on it just like we would anything else that's dangerous but it also has the potential to make our lives a lot easier so i don't know it's a new era of tech we'll see what happens yeah it would be nice if more people took personal responsibility over the things that they built yeah that <laughs> and build that that has not happened in the history of the internet. So yeah, so I'm I'm let, let's say I always say I'm uh, locally optimistic, but globally pessimistic. <laughs> I don't know if that's, anyways. Uh, but yeah, so AI, I use it for summarizing things. That's what it's really great at, like meeting notes or, yeah. um, you know, doing a customer interview, typing notes, and like give me the top three points from this or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it will be interesting to see where it all goes. Absolutely. It's evolving fast. Um, yeah. So, uh, do you have any kind of like bucket list thing? Like, you know, I mean, we're not that old, but at the same time, like, you know, sometimes there's things out in the horizon that you just really want to do. Is there anything in your, uh, if, if I could, if I, I don't know, somehow was financially secure and would leave my job today, you know what job I would love to have is I would love to do uh, either be uh, something in, in technology for a Formula One team. So mm. I love racing and Formula One is the pinnacle of technology. I would love to work for a Formula One team. I don't think the money is probably that great. Uh, but, man, that would be so exciting for me to, to do that. Um, but cars, um, cars going vroom. Cars going vroom yes. and 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 code like what what else is there in life True. besides yeah. that uh, that that would be I think bucket list item in terms of real bucket lists um, 
I don't know. I've always wanted to see the the Great Barrier Reef in Australia because climate change that they'll probably be gone in our, our lifetime. And I, I'd like to check that out, which is depressing, but you know, we have one planet. Let's go. I would like to see more of it before, you know, it changes in a way that's that our children can't understand how it used to be. But in terms of that, you know, my long term bucket list is just to help my kids grow up and be successful. Yeah. Absolutely. Um yeah, and the 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 final uh question is do you feel like there's any kind of common thread through your career that's kind of led you to where you are today like you know you've had a fair amount of success and not not shying away from hard problems I, I think the harder it is and the impossibility of something where someone's like oh you can't do that makes the makes it far more rewarding when I do and you can say it's a chip on my shoulder of like always having to prove people wrong, but it does propel me. I don't know if that's a healthy way of approaching life, but it's carried me pretty, pretty far in my career in, in terms of just thinking of like, here's a challenge. Um, someone out there is doubting me if I can do it. So I'm going to do it and show them um, probably, probably not like the, the best way, but I don't know. It does work for me and just, just bringing that with me. Like, I guess that, that burden of, I want to be successful has carried me pretty far yeah i think it's the engineering mindset right that, that solving hard problems is like can i get doomed to work on this <laughs> calculator yeah. or whatever yeah that's that mindset of like it's very challenging and hard and and especially if someone says i can't or they don't think i can like it's like added fuel to the fire right nothing more satisfying than proving somebody wrong i had uh, yeah <laughs> but it, it's true though and uh, Oftentimes that, that does drive me, but it, the challenge there is when there's no, there's no one to point out those challenges, I have to find them myself. And that, that is a challenge too, but you know, something I'll figure out. Yeah. I think that's a great uh, place to wrap it up. So thanks Jim for coming on the podcast. Thanks Mark. Yeah. yeah cheers. Hey there, before you go, don't forget we're new at this. So any feedback, whether it's a like or subscribe, we'll take those or a comment about what you didn't like or what you'd like to see more of in the future. We'll definitely incorporate that into the next episodes. Uh, I'm really enjoying these conversations. So any type of feedback would be fantastic and especially sharing it with your friends and colleagues. So really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. See you in the next one.